You're listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 2, Ooh. page 4. This is Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. All right, we're in our fall issue. That's right. And the fall f- issue begins today. And our first story in the fall issue is... Uh, Crashing Stolen Cars by Jonathan J. Schlosser. Jonathan J. Schlosser is a senior at Grand Valley State University, where he is studying writing and history. He has been writing his own fiction, which is often quite different than that assigned by his professors, for just over a year now. In that time, he has had the good fortune of publishing 20 individual stories. Most are in the genres of horror, fantasy, or science fiction, though that is always fluctuating. His favorite author is the late Kurt Vonnegut Jr., followed closely by Stephen King. Crashing Stolen Cars by Jonathan J. Schlosser The car was rust and steel, and rotting leather and the smell of gasoline. It crouched in the shadows, overhung by sweeping branches, the dust slowly settling. Two jagged tracks split off from the pavement, breaking free and into the gravel of the shoulder, and came to termination perfectly behind the car's rear tires. The wind blew through the trees, whistling and dropping a shower of leaves onto the exposed seats, and the young man behind the convertible's wheel. Adam licked his lips. He hadn't yet pried his hands away from the leather, or set them in his lap, or reached back to feel skin already cooling over a non-existent pulse. Kels? The girl said nothing. She just sat in the back, her head lolling against the window, her eyes closed. Adam looked at her in the mirror. His tongue tasted like cotton, or polyester. Amazing how stress dried one's mouth out. A cosmic mistake of the vaunted fight-or-flight syndrome. The roadway was desolate. Not just empty, not just abandoned, but as barren as a graveyard. This far toward the middle of nothing, there weren't many people to happen along, especially not at three in the morning. Of course, that was why they'd come. Somewhere, far off and lonely... A raven spat out a call at the deep night. Why it was even awake, Adam had no idea. Not nocturnal, surely. Perhaps just restless. He couldn't fault it for that. Come on, Kels. If you're playing with me, that's enough. Nothing. Not even a flicker of movement, as if the girl were trying to wake up, trying to talk. Her half-unbuttoned blouse fluttered, tugged to one side by the wind. But that was all. Adam swore and got out of the car. The gravel crunched beneath his feet like grinding bones, and a forgotten relic of a childhood song played through his head. Fee, fi, fo, fum. He raked a hand through his hair, staring at the forest and wishing he could pinch himself hard enough. He grabbed the corner of his lips and squeezed until a thin trail of blood ran down his jaw, but the world stayed as it was. Funny how ten minutes could change the course of everything. Well, not funny, not really. Not in the causal sense, but surprising all the same. The car was steel and rust, and part of it flaked away as Adam stepped up to the back seat and laid his hands on the edge. The rear window was up. He leaned around it, close to her, close enough to see where her skin had split in a tear across her brow. Cracked white bone lurked beneath. It wasn't bleeding as hard anymore, but it had been. Oh, it had been. Please, Kelsey! Nothing. Adam sat in the dirt, leaning back against the car. It was stolen. He didn't know whose it was, except that it had been parked in the driveway and the keys had been in the ignition. And it hadn't been blocked in by the others. He'd wondered when he got in who it belonged to, but now he didn't care at all. He dropped his head and massaged his fingers in little circles against his temples. Things didn't spin or lurch, 
and the contents of his stomach seemed fairly determined not to come rushing up his throat. The alcohol was wearing off. At least there was that. Thirsty Thursday, they called it, or Freedom Friday, or Smashed Saturday, or Slammed Sunday. It didn't really matter. All it meant was that each day of the week had its own little title that made it all right to drink until you couldn't see, or think, or consider what you were doing when you led your girlfriend out of the hallway where you'd been making out so contentedly, or drive when you were taking her somewhere the two of you could be a bit more alone. It wasn't my fault. Adam spoke softly, but the words sounded huge and ominous in the night. Even the raven had fallen silent. Just a deer, you know, a damn deer. They were everywhere. If hazard number one was state cops with quotas to fill, number two was deer. And the margin was close. This one had come out of the brush at a dead run, muscles moving beneath its smooth coat like pistons. Adam hadn't seen it, hadn't slowed, hadn't even had time to think about which side the brake pedal was on before the car had been bucking forward, throwing him against his belt and Kelsey against the back of his seat. The car was more rust than steel and it crumpled beneath the weight of the suicide. Adam had jammed the wheel to the left, slamming his foot into the floorboards twice before he found the brake. He felt Kelsey hit behind him and heard the crunch as her head connected with something hard, like a watermelon being struck with an axe. She'd hit a support, probably, the ribs of the driver's seat. It should have been padded over, but the padding had long since rotted away to expose the metal. Then he hadn't felt her anymore. Just that initial contact. Then she'd rebounded away, landed on the back seat and not fallen off again even when he found the brakes and slewed the car onto the shoulder. She shouldn't even have been back there. If it wasn't for him, she wouldn't have. He remembered she'd laughed about it, almost falling over, more from the alcohol than any true humor, saying she'd be in the back getting ready for him. All he had to do was drive somewhere safe as fast as he could. She draped her coat over the back of the passenger's seat, making a show of it, then begun working at the buttons of her blouse. Adam swore again, slamming his hand against his knee. He knew he should be crying by all rights, but he wasn't. A voice way back in his mind said something about trauma and shock and how he'd cry later. He shook his head, and far off the raven cawed once more. So what now? That was surely the question of the ages, wasn't it? Surely John Wilkes Booth thought the same thing after he shot Lincoln, or Timothy McVeigh after he blew up the Murrah Federal Building. What now? Adam stood, staying back from the car, and stared down at Kelsey. Her blonde hair fell across her face in a way that was almost attractive, but streaks of blood ran through it. Her blouse had been unbuttoned to the middle of her stomach, and he could see that her chest wasn't rising and falling beneath her bra, not even shallowly. Her eyes were closed, so he couldn't tell if they'd rolled back in their sockets or not. But he knew they had. He knew. Lights! Adam jerked his head around, staring down the black snake of pavement. A car was coming. Not fast, but very definitely coming. And there was nowhere else to turn out here. They'd drive past him, see the wreck of the vehicle, the blood-soaked, mangled corpse of the deer, and stop. Even if they weren't the cops, he'd have no choice but to report it and the next blood-soaked corpse wouldn't be quite so innocent. Or this car, this very one, was the cops. He hadn't exactly been subtle, hadn't been thinking straight enough to be when he stole the convertible, and there was a good chance it had already been called in. Biting his lip, Adam climbed back into the driver's seat. He touched the keys. His hand was shaking. He lowered his head for a moment until he had himself under control. He was in the middle of nowhere, in a stolen car with his dead girlfriend in the back seat. And, though he no longer felt drunk, he would blow quite a number if the police decided to give him a breath test. He drove slowly this time, watching the trees. The line of them looked like a wall of soldiers hemming him in. Finally, he spotted a break, a small dirt road winding its way to the north. The area had been logging country once upon a time. And there were hundreds of these abandoned roads, only used now by hunters in the fall or snowmobilers in the winter. The lights were closer. Adam couldn't make out anything behind the glare, but the approaching car seemed to be slowing. Any moment now, and the red and blues would slash the darkness, tearing it apart and dragging him away in chains. Adam pulled down the two-track. The road curved back and forth as it cut between the trees, avoiding those blockages that would have been too much trouble to remove. 
The trees rose up, spikes stabbing into the soft underbelly of the sky. Their shadows fell in long, hard lines that reminded Adam of fangs, incisors, teeth made for cutting and ripping things to pieces, teeth made to do the same job as the unprotected back of his seat. Rip away lives. The gully wasn't much. Adam almost didn't see it, but suddenly the car was right on the edge, crumbling the clay and earth down over the side. He pulled to a stop, further over where it was safe, and got out under the moonlight. It looked like there had been a small stream once, maybe even a river. Too small for the loggers to float their trees down, but maybe something for them to bathe in. Whatever it had been, it was gone now. The dry bed lay fifteen feet below, covered in brush and dead leaves. Kels, babe, this is your last chance. If you can hear me, say something. He worked the car through a quarter turn so it was facing away from the drop, backing up until the ground felt soft beneath the rear tires. Headlight beams filtered through the trees behind him, broken into fragments by the trunks and branches. The light bounced out over the gully, throwing weird shadows across the breach. Adam shifted the car into neutral. He got out and walked around front. The ground was a soft clay that tried to rise up around his boots. His feet pulled out with a sucking sound behind each step. He slipped once on the way to the front, then set his hands on the broken hood and pushed. A sharp beam of light fell over him. The voice that followed came from a megaphone, deep and full of authority. Hold it right there. Step away from the... Adam shoved. And the car fell. He'd expected it to take longer. But the bank just gave away behind the rear tires and the vehicle pitched back. There was a screech as the underbody slid across rocks and the axle twisted, stuck. And then the front end swung up and caught Adam under the chin. His vision exploded and he fell back with a cry. Mud and clay leached up into his pants, coated his hands as they plunged in. He shook his head, clearing it just in time to see the car slide from view. Footsteps ran up behind him, chased by shouts that sounded as if they were from another world. His ears were ringing and he couldn't make out the words. The tone, however, was unmistakable. Someone grabbed his arms and yanked him to his feet. Another man stepped over to the edge of the gully, glared down into it for a moment, and then whirled to face Adam with both shock and dismay registered on his face. He shone his flashlight on Adam's eyes, and that look changed. I should have known. The officer shook his head. Whose was it this time? Adam swallowed. I don't know what you're talking about. It just came out, a reflex, even with the car right there, probably half buried in muck and underbrush. You think I'm an idiot, Adam? The officer sighed, then looked at his partner. This is second time? The man holding Adam's arms grunted. Third. Third. The first officer cocked his head to the side. You're as crazy as they get, aren't you? I told them to lock you up after all that talk last time. All that nonsense about a dead girl and how you didn't mean to kill her or steal the car. They should have thrown you in Cedar Ridge. That's what I told them. This time I bet they'll listen. Adam felt his eyes grow hot. I hit a deer. She was in the back, getting changed. And it came out of nowhere. He looked at the gully, wishing he hadn't pushed the car after all. Look, maybe she's not dead. Go check. We can still save her. His voice broke on the last word. The officer stepped forward, his face inches from Adam's. Listen to me. There's no one else in that car. It's a convertible, Adam. I can see right in the top from here. It's just as empty as the others. You hear me? That can't be true. Adam pulled to the side. Hands held him tight. She must have fallen out. She's down there right now dying, I swear to you. The officer looked past Adam, at his partner. You've heard his story, haven't you? Rumors. They're probably true, sick as they sound. He got drunk and killed his girlfriend in a car wreck back in, oh, 99. The officer tapped Adam on the forehead. Isn't that right? Got in a serious crash that time. The car burned, the whole deal. Wasn't much left when it was over. Since then, he's been stealing cars and wrecking them just the same, then babbling on about how she's inside, reliving the same accident over and over, I guess. Adam glared. Listen to me! We have, Adam. We've listened to your story for over eight years, and it never changes. He walked past, back toward the idling squad car. 
This time, maybe they'll lock you up for good. No driving allowed over at Cedar Ridge. That would be a merciful thing for you, I bet. The cop pulled him away, radioing in for a wrecker, and Adam let the tears go. They streamed down his face like the blood had down Kelsey's, hot and violent. Adam yanked at his hands, but the cop's grip was iron. Pain lanced through his shoulders. He twisted and thrashed until they snapped a pair of cuffs onto his wrists and shoved him into the back seat of the squad car. Then his protests died into a whisper. There, head lolling against the opposite window, a vicious blood-filled cut marring her forehead, was Kelsey. She sat opposite him, her hands also cuffed, her blouse falling open to reveal the black bra over breasts that would never again rise and fall with respiration or passion. As he watched, her eyes snapped open. They were rolled back, glazed balls of pure white. Her lips twitched, pulling upward in a smile. And Adam screamed. Author's Note This story, Crashing Stolen Cars, was actually written with a publication in mind. I had just discovered the e-zine Crimson Highway and was looking to get into their pages. They were looking for pieces about love after a fashion, so I knew that would have to factor in. I had just started writing horror, so I knew the piece would be going more in that direction than fantasy, though it has elements of both. Also, the name of the e-zine itself gave me a bit of inspiration, as I'm sure you can see. Then it became about the car. I had a very specific image in my head of the car sitting on the side of the road. That was all, but it was strong. More than strong. So I started off with that. As you may remember, the car isn't described softly with similes. It is rust and steel and rotting leather and the smell of gasoline. It crouches in the shadows, overhung by sweeping branches. And let it go from there. It grew quickly, because a car that has just stopped quickly usually has a very good, very urgent reason. In this case, the girl. And I let it grow. I was in the library where I work, and I had a bit of time before my shift. So I just let the story grow and twist and change, and eventually, crashing stolen cars came out the other end. Also, it should be noted that I submitted this to Crimson Highway, where it was rejected outright. For all my efforts, I must have misjudged their publication. All right, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed Crashing Stolen Cars by Jonathan J. Schlosser. Yeah, even though I can't say that last name, uh, believe me, I tried. Um, we appreciate, Jonathan, you sending in that uh, story. If you have a story to submit to us, how do they get that story to us, Big Anchorage? They just put it into uh, the body of an email and send that email to submissions at doonsteve.com. That's right. Our website is www.doonsteef.com, D-U-N-E-S-T-E-E-F.com. And uh, also, if anybody has any comments or suggestions, they can get those to us how? Um, you can do it two ways. Uh, first of all, you can just go to the website, www.doonsteef.com. I just said that. And uh, leave a comment on the blog post for each particular story. And I'll tell you one thing. Authors really appreciate comments on their stories. So they would love to see you put a comment on there about their story. So, you know, if you've got a comment, maybe a suggestion for your author that you just heard, drop them a line. Put that comment on the, on the website. They read them. I'm telling okay, you. Okay, I, I understand. I'm, don't guilt me anymore. I will put a Do comment on Do it now, it. Rish. I'll give, you, I'll give you a minute. Go, go ahead and put some comments on. Okay, just a second. How do you spell sh- Schlosser? And also, the other way that you can put a comment, uh, that you can get a comment to us, is just by sending it to editor at doonsteef.com. We've got a uh, mailbox for anything you want to send our way, as long as it's not spam. You may even get a a message back from our uh, third host of the show, Mr. R-O-8-O-T. He's the one who uh, manages that uh, all those things for us. He keeps uh, keeps an eye on that, keeps the spam out, and uh, deletes all the naughty stuff. Third host of the show, huh? Yeah. All right. Hmm. You know, I I wasn't gonna say anything, but I I I think I gotta say something, man. I I'm sorry. I don't mean to bring the show down, but I, I'm I'm not sure that ha- having R O eight O T on board is is the, maybe the smartest thing to 
to do. I, I don't understand what, what's going on. Okay, well, you know how we have a PayPal account attached, right. and, uh, and that's what we use to pay our authors. Uh -huh. And he has, for some reason, access to that account. Well, I looked at it the other day, and uh, I saw some money going out that uh, probably shouldn't have been. And, and, and I know it wasn't you. I know it wasn't me. The only other person, or quote-unquote person, is, <laughs> is, is the robot. And I don't know if it's going to some offshore account. I don't know if he's buying love bots well, or, 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 or that kind of thing. Uh, all I know is that uh, uh, two days ago, uh -huh. he sent an undisclosed amount of money to a William Meekle. Now, I don't know William Meekle. You don't know that guy either. And so I'm just thinking that there's something Dude, on... Hold on a minute. William Meekle's the guy uh, who, who did next week's story. You know that, right? Oh. Yeah. Dude, oh. Um, you got to check your email more often, man. Okay. Hey, uh, good, good job over there, R08OT. Yeah, you don't want to know. I mean, yeah. Okay. So uh, anyways, moving on. Um, what we usually do is, uh, this is the point where we beg for donations. Um, right. I, I don't know about you, I, especially after this embarrassment with uh, the robot, I, I, I don't really feel up to begging for donations. Dude, I don't want to beg for donations, man. Okay, but one of us has to beg for donations. Okay. I don't want to do it. H how about I Rochambeau you for it? You What's that? You don't know what Rochambeau is? Well, it sounds okay. familiar. Basically, is it like it's, paper, scissors, and, and rock? Well, uh, some people do it that way. This is how I've always done it. Um, it's just a, it's a contest of, you know, who's going to take it the farthest. Basically, who's going to hang in there the longest. Oh, the I like, I like those. The person who hangs in the longest is the one who wins and doesn't have to do the donations. Sure. So what we're going to do is, um, well, you know, we're, we'll just kick each other in the nuts. And whoever takes it the longest is the one who doesn't have to, uh, to beg for donations. Wait right? a second. I'm, I'm not sure I understand. We, we, we each have to kick each other in the nuts? Right. At the same time? No, you, we, we take turns. I'll go first. <laughs> okay. So, ah, dude. So now I get to kick you in the nuts. Uh, actually, no, I give up, man. I'll do the I'll do the donation plea. <sighs> so, anyways, yes, we do pay our authors. Um, our authors get money for these stories they write, which you know is as it should be. I mean, these people work hard on these stories, and so we pay our authors with the donations that we receive, folks. So please. Send some donations our way so we can continue to pay these wonderful authors and bring you these wonderful stories. That was worth it, wasn't it? Hardly. <laughs> oh, I, right. I think I taste blood, man. Yeah. <clears throat> Ow. I used to play soccer. <laughs> <sighs> cool. <laughs> okay, so... Um, all right, so this is the first story of our fall issue. It's a little bit late coming. We're uh, almost halfway through October. That wasn't our fault, though. Well, technically. Yeah, it was. Uh, okay, well, ex well, I'll explain it. Uh, what, what basically happened was 08 OT had the night off last week. So we came in here and we tried to record today's story uh, all by ourselves. And we did record it. It, it, it turns out that we did, yes. But uh, what happened was we recorded, we went home, we came back to work on it the next day, and there was nothing. We right, you played it and it was just silence. Complete silence. And uh, so I, you know, did my best because yeah, 08 OT was on vacation the whole week, so I, I, I just had to figure it out myself and... I tried to find. I couldn't find it. There was. I just thought we'd screwed it up and we were going to have to re-record it. So. And it wasn't the first time that's happened. That's well. true. That is true. Yes. So uh, luckily, 08 OT came back a little early. He, you know, plugged in and quickly located what had actually happened. We found our recording, and so now here we are with a 
the story. It, it, it did record, just somehow we saved a silent version of it. <laughs> and Delayed OT found the non-silent version. Thank you. So, so it's fair to say that uh, this is all Delayed OT's fault. Right. It's all the robot's uh, fault. Wait, is that really fair? <laughs> I, I'm going to blame the robot. All right. I guess that is your way to, to deal you, with things. So it is mid-October, right. greatest month of the year. Yeah. Well, and last time we talked a little bit about that October scary story event that I do. Uh huh. That that we do. And we, yeah, we invited the whole. Uh, we invited the whole John Smith. Right. Yes, we invited our our one listener to join in with us and to uh, do a October scary story event story. And basically, all you got to do is write a story this month. Right. It's, it's the middle of the month, so you still have a little bit of time before the 31st. You can write this scary story. It doesn't have to be long. Yeah. Um, short is uh, as good as long. It just has to be scary. That's the... Uh, short is as good as long. And you know how many times I wish I had heard that in college? <clears throat> Anyways, um, so how, are, how is your scary story coming, Rish? You, you started work on yours? I did start work on mine. Uh, it's not really coming along very well i'd say i probably have a page um i don't know i I, i'm one of those terrible people that that thrives on pressure and thrives on a deadline Mm -hmm. and so if you said that it was due in two days then i'd probably get to work on it and 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 pump it out and it would be you know the same crap i usually write (laughs) but it would be done right um and i'm hoping that that does happen right now it's just I, i need a good kick in Okay, bad. I, I phrased that poorly. I need a little motivation. Uh, uh, how about you? How's your, your October scary story coming? <laughs> well, um, I have decided what story I'm going to write. Oh, cool. I, uh, wait. No, that's not cool. That, that, that's, that's you. you. You've got ideas of stories from high school that you still haven't written. Right. Yeah, this is actually a... From the Carter administration, even. <laughs> I was like, oh... Yeah, so I sat down to write a little on it today. I wrote about a sentence, and then I thought, oh, yeah, I'm not sure. So I went on to Wikipedia, and I looked up a few things to make sure, you know, my my world was going to make sense, and it was going to be correct, and things like that. And I'm not sure the Wikipedia is the best place well, to go. To. the Internet's an amazing place. It, it has the answer to an awful lot of questions. It's pretty pretty cool. So, yeah, I was able to find out a few things, and... Yeah, that's I, the sentence is about as far as I've gotten. So I'm gonna have to really get it in gear. I, I, I'm a, obviously I think I may be a little worse off. I don't know about whether I thrive on pressure. I just let the deadline go by, and then yeah, and then two years down the line, maybe I finally do get around to it. Who knows? So, but sh- I, I do plan on actually completing this story. It's not going to be a long one, so I think I'll be I'll still be fine. So. Um, hey, hey, 008 OT, are you uh, going to write a October scary story? He's, he says he's done already. Uh, yeah, that's what I like to hear. He's done. <laughs> Am I a character in your story, 08 OT? He, uh, he says there's a. It, it starts with a gruesome death scene, and so yes, you are a character in his okay. story. Okay, <clears throat> boy. <laughs> A good, good robot. So, yes, he is very, very. No, no, I meant that sarcastically. He's not oh. a good robot at all. Uh, so, anyways, I did manage to, to uh, while O eight O T was gone on vacation, and everything. I did manage to post on our blog the uh, info about the scary story event, and there is room for comments on that post. So, if you'd like to get on there and comment and maybe talk about how your scary story event is coming along, feel free to do that. I doubt anyone will, but. It would be neat. <laughs> yeah, it would be. I, I, I agree with you there. It was, so okay, I guess that wraps up our, uh, our, our podcast for today. Yeah, I think. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Oh, yeah. There's, there's one more thing we got to do. Oh, no. You want to Rochambeau Thanks. for it? I'll... No, no. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. <clears throat> oh, boy. Okay. So this is our hate letter of the week. That's right. Dear Rish and Big. I hope I get to be your hate letter of the week because I totally hate you guys and your podcast. You guys suck so much, I even hate the stories you read. Oh, that's, that's not cool. I listen every week just so I can feel better about myself. And I sometimes sell drugs to children with Down syndrome. And it always works. Dude, who is this guy? 
you guys suck in voice, you suck in personality, you suck in trying to be funny. My bet is that if you had to compete at sucking things through a straw, you'd suck at that too. This guy is really mm. hilarious. Maybe even swallow the straw. I'll send this off now, but I could write a lot more if you needed me to. I don't think you do, since you have to know by now how much you suck. Hoping you die, Javier McEntree. Javier? Javier? Hmm. J-A-V-I-E-R? Oh, yeah, I think that's Javier. Javier McEntree. Oh, uh, keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Yeah, please. All right, well, that was our show. Thanks for listening. Thank you. As always, this has been Rish Outfield. And uh, I'm Big Anklevich. And that's 08 OT. For those about to rock fire. We salute you. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Crashing Stolen Cars by Jonathan J. Schle- by Jonathan J. Sch- Say it again. Schlosser. Is that right? Oh, yes. Schlosser. That doesn't sound right. Is that right? Schlosser? Yes. Crashing Stolen Cars by Jonathan J. Slosh- Slosher. Crash. <laughs> 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 by Jonathan J. Slosher. Schlosser. I said it that time. Crashing Stolen Cars by Jonathan J. Slosher. Crashing Stolen Cars by Jonathan J. Slosher. I thought I had it that time for sure. This isn't funny anymore. Okay, Slosher. Schlosser. Schlosser, right? Schlosser. Crashing Stolen Cars by Jonathan J. Slosher. (laughs) By Jonathan J. Schlosser.